Thank you very much, sure. Jim. Take a seat. I yep. think this one is reserved okay. for you. And um, I am also the um, court jester, the uh, pauseklon, we say in Danish, who will talk a little bit while uh, the, our two panelists, Heather Swanson and Jens Christian Svenning, Svenning get organized. Y your talk, Jim, reminded me of a, of a Jerry Seinfeld lecture or a stand up. He's a stand up comedian. He had this joke. He said, Imagine if you look at the Earth from Mars, if a, a Martian was looking at Earth with a very powerful telescope and saw what was going on, that uh, being up there would imagine that dogs ruled the world. Because what that Martian would see is two life forms, one of which was shitting and, and the other was picking up the shit and putting it in little plastic bags. So from a Martian point of view, dogs rule the world. And it is that kind of dog, dogs rule the world kind of story that you've told us. Very much one of um, the story of alienation. You know, it's usually said that, uh, you know, history is written by the victors. And the victors who write our history is a particular kind of victor. Humans who have agriculture and who live in states and have written, you know, um, uh, forms of communication. You have given us a, 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 a story of a different kind of perspective, how uh, the, the, the story of human victory and civilization is actually a story of our own willing subjugation, our own willing uh, subjugation into stupidity and, you know, willing shrinkage of our own brain. It's an amazing story and one that actually takes agency, historical agency away from humans and delegates it a little bit to all the other critters and, and species who inhabit this late multi-species um, resettlement camp, as you told it. I, I read this piece uh, in Nature, I believe it was, about uh, the domestication of dogs, where the argument was that dogs, uh, wolves as it were, actually domesticated themselves. They did so by beginning to frequent the dumps of early human settlements uh, and beginning to eat the cooked food, we talked about cooked food and fl at flat stomachs earlier, they're beginning to eat the cooked food, thereby actually self-changing their own digestive system and making them amenable to human uh, you know, domestication. So it's not us who actively domesticated wolves and made them our pets, it's actually wolves who decided, as it were, to become our co-species relations and, and through that process actually learned to to be one of those species who are acutely aware of what we do and can read the tiniest little sign, often much better than other humans can. So, yeah, thank you for doing this. Um, I will now introduce our two panelists and stop hogging the floor. Um, to your left, it is Jens Christian Svenning, who is professor in the Department of Bioscience, Eco-Informatics and Biodiversity here at Aarhus University. Jens Christian Svenning has published, I just looked it up, it's amazing, over 300 articles, uh, just in 2013, over 40? What? How can one keep up? You know, on a number of topics uh, about long-term climate change, about the global dissemination of palms, about the extinction of large wild animals within the last 100,000 years, and it is this, the extinction of large wild animals, megafauna, within the last 100,000 years that overlaps the end part of it overlaps with the story that Jim told us, and I think there's something really interesting going on there about the ending for some, and most of us, all of us here, of hunting and the change to agriculture that is both a political story but perhaps also an extinction story. Uh, Jens Christian Svenning has written, uh, I said that already, I won't repeat it, but he runs several large research projects on biogeography, and the global distribution of palm trees. And I think we've been to the field a couple of times here in the cent center of Jutland, and Jens Christian uh, knows more about animals and plants, can tell their, their particular names in Danish, in English, and in Latin. And he knows more about these things than anyone else I know. So thank you very much for coming, Jens Christian. Our second panelist is Heather Swanson, who is assistant professor uh, of anthropology, also here at Aarhus University. Uh, she's from the United States, but uh, speaks fluent Danish and has spent many years looking at salmon and uh, salmon farming and fish domestica domestication both in Japan and in the US. Heather Swanson is our resident um, expert on domestication and her research reminds us perhaps 
uh, very clearly that humans domesticated not only animals who live on land, as you told us about, Jim, but also animals who live in water. Her particular interest is in the Anthropocene. For those of you who are, f who are not familiar with that concept, it is the name for an age in which humans have come to be a force of nature. It seems to be a story of mastery, but it's really a story, if you look around and see all the storms and uh, climate change, etc., it's a story of failure, and it is relevant to, I think, the story of failure and self-stupidification <laughs> that uh, you told us about, Jim. Um, thank you very much uh, for coming also, Heather. I, I cannot wait to hear what you have to say, but I would like to move over here and perhaps ask you, Jens Christian, to start the debate. Um, just remind all of you, uh, did I say it before? We will talk amongst ourselves for about 20 uh, minutes. I hope you will listen in. After that, um, we will open for questions from the floor. And please put up your hands. I know there are people who know more about everything that we've said than we know. So <laughs> join the debate, please. Thank you for the nice introduction, Nils. Um, and thank you very much, Jim, for a fantastic lecture. Extremely inspiring. Um, so yes, I, I'd like to start with this um, this a bit deeper time perspective, since it's something that I have a, a deep interest in. Um, and I, I would like to explore a little bit with you to, to what extent the, the start of domestication is linked to uh, pressure on, on the available resources in nature. S and, and one could take the megafauna extinction as a, as a case, because if we look to our predecessor here in Europe, the Neanderthals, there's quite a, uh, strong evidence that they had a very particular dietary specialization on on obtaining high protein food by hunting megafauna like some Neanderthal hunting camps you can see that they didn't really bother to hunt anything less than 500 kilos so <laughs> juvenile rhinos bison and, and oh, one exception was beaver which is the idea is that they also wanted to hunt beaver for the pelts and for the fatty tail um, but they had this kind of very specialized diet, and then Homo sapiens enters the scene, probably outcompetes the Neanderthals, it's still debated. And, and at the same time, we see the start of the megafauna extinction in Europe. We lose the rhinos, we don't have any rhinos around here anymore, uh, elephants and so on. And with the expansion of Homo sapiens across the world, we see the same thing. It's of course still a, a controversial issue, but I think it's, it's extremely clear that that this loss of elephants and so on across the world is very neatly tied to the arrival of Homo sapiens. And I'd just like to hear your thoughts on, on, this, on this, if there is a relation between the loss of these natural resources and domestication. Anybody else? Oh, um, this is, it, it's a crucial question and it's, as you know, uh, better than I, that it's still a matter of, of a huge amount of debate. So there is something called the broad spectrum revolution, uh, which is linked to the disappearance of megafauna, uh, in which people move lower in the tropic right, uh, pyramid uh, for more available but less desirable foods, and that also require more work in order to gather. And the argument has historically been that they do this because the easy food sources, uh, the turtles, the megafauna, and so on, uh, are disappearing. And I think the evidence in the new world for this is actually very strong uh, because we can date when human beings arrived and, uh, and the disappearance of much of the megafauna. Uh, the things that I've read on Mesopotamia and the Middle East suggest that you would then expect that these domestications would have occurred in the places where the resource constraints were the most severe. And it turns out that they are not. Um, and uh, so the domestications occur not in the places where you would demographically expect them to be. So because I'm not a specialist and because I've kind of done this in an effort to sort of understand as a kind of layman in a provocative way uh, the existence of states and domestications. I, I am not, uh, I neither have the information nor the inclination uh, nor the expertise, if I did have the information, to resolve this dispute myself. So I, that speculation 
and uh, I'm, I, I await scientists to tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> I do know, I might add, one of the really interesting, one of my favorite books, which is a 4,000 year history of the Chinese uh, environment, is called Retreat of the Elephants. Because 4,000 years ago, there were elephants in the Beijing area, and now they're just in the forests of, of Southeast Asia. Uh, and I gather, I gather elephants were kind of a cosmopolitan species everywhere uh, in Northern Europe as well. Thank You've you. actually done research on elephants. Yes, right? yes, and uh, I, uh, thank you for this very thoughtful answer. Yes, it's, tr it's true if you go back to the sort of expansion of Homo sapiens out of, out of Africa, there were elephants everywhere but Australia and in all kinds of ecosystems from tropical rainforest to Arctic steppes and from the Alaska to Patagonia. All different species, but lots of species. Um, and they're pretty much all gone except for yeah, a few. Um, so so it, if, this, if this disappearance of the megafauna and maybe general pressure on easily available natural resources is it's not, we're not able to resolve that now. I'd like to, to bring up another idea that has been uh, discussed in relation to the onset of or start of domestication and or agriculture, and that's climate stability. Because in this whole uh, climate change debate, it's often asked that, argued that the Holocene is a particular stable period, at least in the context of the time that Homo sapiens has been out of Africa, and that this kind of relative stability that we have had in the Holocene in the climate is a necessary precondition for for either the st either development of domestication and or development of agrarian civilization. And I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Well, I I do know that there are uh, a certain number of people who were interested in the domestication of grains. Um, Concentrate on the younger Dryas era, uh, era, which is, I think, 10,800 to 9,600 uh, BC, and uh, it was an area, a period that was quite cold and dry. Uh, and the argument was that the the grains that were available were fewer, and that people would who knew planting already would do a little planting in order to have a little insurance crop, a place to come back to. And so that's one theory. I'm not fit to kind of judge uh, that theory. And then after the Younger Dryas, it got actually warm quite quickly, I gather, and wetter. And as a result, you actually had a flourishing of grasses kind of everywhere in this uh, area. So it was both good for agriculture, but it also would have been good for natural stands of cereals without bothering to plant them in the first place. The, I, it's worth saying that the domestication of cereals is it's a kind it's a question that I now believe to be a dumb question uh, that is to say exactly is it making a little hole and putting a seed in it that counts as the domestication of a plant is it transplanting a place from one to the other is it encouraging and taking a few weeds out uh, it seems to me the process of uh, what I know some of you have been talking about in terms of niche construction. Uh, this is going on all the time and that the rearrangement and reorganization of the natural world uh, is a kind of continuum and exactly where you say domestication occurred is completely arbitrary. So there, it's not as if there's this Thomas Edison light bulb moment in which, ah, I just discovered how to plant, uh, you know, Wheat, yeah. but do you, do you think that if, if I were to paraphrase what Jens Christian was just asking those two questions, might it be pressure from the lack of megafauna, or might it be pressure from you know climatic changes? You say no, probably not. It, it is a political choice. It, it seems to me that you know I'm a dumb agriculturalist. You know, so I'm asking a dumb question. Why make this choice? Uh, you know, why would I? Why would I? You know enter in this, into this willing subjugation that made me stupider and uh, you know, my life less interesting and less affluent if it wasn't pressure from the outside? So there are two, again, there, these are questions that I'm not smart enough to resolve and I, I haven't been resolved by people who are smarter than I am too. Uh, and the, it's clear that from the, the people were planting on a very small scale 
uh, plants and uh, domesticated animals uh, from 9000 BC. Uh, but they did it on a kind of marginal scale on the side. It never became a major activity, partly because it tied them down and didn't allow them to exploit the other sources of food. And the natural world was richer, although with the disappearance of megafauna, it was becoming less rich over time. Uh, there's, a, there's a theory by a man named Robert Carnero that uh, about those places that are hemmed in, in which you have, if you like, a alluvium, uh, but it's surrounded by desert or impassable water and so on, where people can't actually move out. And he would argue, and I think that I'm inclined to think uh, favorably of this idea, that in such hemmed-in circumstances, it's easier for a political unit called the state to keep people there, right, and to confine them to one subsistence activity. And since this soil is, uh, alluvium is rich. So the, the other thing to add is that there is one form, although I, I lied to you earlier by saying that agriculture was more work, it is almost always more work, but there's something called flood retreat agriculture uh, in which if you have, let's say, like the early Nile, you have a flood that delivers fresh silt so deep, it's incredibly rich, uh, you can follow the recession of the flood waters and plant after it. And that's probably about as easy a subsistence form. So that's a form of agriculture that compares favorably with hunting and gathering. So where that form of agriculture was easy to do, I think it was quite uh, commonly uh, practiced. But it was a lazy man's agriculture, the way, you know, we all want to minimize the amount of drudgery, right? So uh, we were, we, could you say you were, we were slowly lured into it because the great rivers of the Euphrates and the Nile was where these things started? You know, we were lured into it, planting, you know, the, the riverbeds and thinking, oh, this is a short, great idea. The short version, and then being uh, I'm, I'm stealing my own thunder from later in the manuscript, I guess, but, you know, these big concentrations of people and crops and plants are killing people. The rates of mortality are enormous. And you can reflect on this yourself that until the 19th century, no European city ever reproduced produced itself demographically from within its own population. It had to bring people in from the countryside. It wasn't until water and sewage and so on uh, made cities relatively more healthy. China is actually different, but that's not that's another story. So the fact is that these early concentration of agriculture were killing people and people of course who knew right away that when you had an epidemic the safest thing to do was to leave and scatter and disperse. And so they did that. So these these agricultural societies would have disappeared unless they also uh, had not invented wars for the capture of slaves in order to bring them back to the alluvium. So it was this constant turnover. Could they capture enough population to replace the mortality and the flight uh, over time? And most successful ones were able to do this. Is that what Marx called primitive accumulation? You know? Yes. Kind of. I'll see why not. Do you want to? Oh, you have. Do, do I, you I have one. Yes, sure. Final. Go ahead. I also wanted to just make a, a slight comment. So, do you know the movie Ten Thousand BC? Uh, you you might like it because I think it's it's uh, it's not a very historically accurate uh, <laughs> movie, but it really it really follows your scenario for for, yeah. for early civilization. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I'm waiting for Monty Python to do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's close to that. Anyway, <laughs> but I just had a last question. In since we're now here at the Futures Lecture Series, and and I was just interested to hear your thoughts on what could be future Anthropocene dynamics in the domestication of, mm -hmm. of the species we depend on and ourselves? Well, I, maybe Heather will talk about this. I mean, the last frontier of domestication is aquatic uh, life and our effort to domesticate uh, uh, aquatic, uh, aquatic life. Mm -hmm. the, um, I, I'm not... It's interesting to me, it's not, my, it's, it's not my field, and I'm sure you've all reflected a little bit on this, the fact that um, the popularity of the Paleolithic diet uh, these days, right, and the realization that uh, 
our food habits changed and uh, evolved much faster than our body's capacity to process without uh, pathological effects uh, the um, uh, uh, the contemporary diet that we have now. I find it rather I find it rather interesting that. Um, Whenever you do something, you realize that there are hundreds of other people doing it as well, and uh, as if you're following a fad. And one of the fads today that I confess I fell into, not knowing it was a fad, I try to avoid fads, um, is uh, the deep history. The idea that somehow we have come to such a pretty pass that it's occurred to me and lots and lots of other people to ask, how the hell did we get here? Uh, and that requires that you go back thousands and thousands of years to see in a wide-angle lens the history of society and states and, uh, and our species. And I, th I think I would not be doing this if I could take progress and life for granted uh, the way we did 20, 30, 40 years ago. So it's the, it's the collective unease about the jam we've gotten ourselves and the planet into that leads me and others, I now realize, to try to understand it in a much larger historical perspective. Heather, do you want to? As if I can go ahead and jump in on the conversation. Water, if you um, want to. First, um, <laughs> thanks, Jim, for such a rich presentation. and. Um, it was so rich that I feel like I'm overflowing with questions about it. And so I want to group them into a couple of sets of related questions. Um, first, as someone who works on the borders of fields as diverse as cultural studies and fisheries science, I want to begin by drawing attention to the incredibly, um, Im one of the incredibly important features of Jim's talk, which is its radical interdisciplinarity. Um, the talk that we just heard you know, took us leaping across political science, archaeology, evolutionary biology, and it's this temporal scope, this deep history, um, that brings Jim into dialogue with such things as ongoing genetic research. And such undisciplined scholarship, undisciplined here is a strong compliment, um, strikes me as highly significant. And so one thing that might be interesting is if you talked a little bit more about your methodological approaches, but we can put that aside, that might be fun or might not. Um, before we do that, I'd like to think a bit um, about, the rippling, about the rippling effects of domestication in both space and time. Um, one of the things that, about domestication is that it doesn't seem to stay fenced in. Right. Um, the effects of the, multi, of the late Neolithic multi-species resettlement camp, as you've called it, don't remain within the camp, um, its pastures and fields. Um, the zoonotic diseases spawned in domestic agriculture, for example, quickly spread out into distant forests. While domestication is often thought of as a practice of enclosure, of fencing in, it's also a story of wild proliferation and spreading effects. Um, this is something that's true for human lives as well. Um, as some of your other work has shown, grain-based states dramatically affected the lives of non-state peoples. Um, who become raiders, making use of weak state settlements, um, or who develop other new methods of negotiating with and avoiding states. So, my question here is this. Might you tell us a bit more about what the margins look like in a multi-species sense after the multi-species resettlement camp is already underway? How about the plants, animals, microbes, and people who go feral? Um, how are the human-non-human -human relations of the periphery remade by what is going on in the centers through, for example, escapes um, and unintended consequences of all kinds? Uh, and that, okay. Well, Should I start? Yeah, go for that. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a tall order. Let me, let me start. <laughs> Let me start by this question of, uh, if you like, outside the resettlement camp and its consequences. And uh, let me start actually with uh, uh, Homo sapiens. Um, the last part of the manuscript that I'm working on, I actually call the golden age of barbarians. Um, and that is, um, there is this idea 
that agriculturalists and pastoralists and hunters and gatherers are generally thought of by most laymen as hermetically sealed categories in which uh, people do not move back and forth. And the fact is that people move back and forth all the time. So the period that I'm talking about uh, in the last, uh, the, let's say, 15,000 BC to 7,000 BC, people are moving back depending on climate mm -hmm. change and so on, from pastoralism to hunting and gathering. They change their, you can think of them as having a portfolio that they adjust different portions of depending on what is uh, what makes sense at a particular time. The interesting thing to me is that when you get sedentary communities, they become like one-stop shopping for hunters and gatherers and pastoralists to raid. That is to say, it's like all the game in one place. As the Berbers say, raids are our agriculture. Uh, and so in that, in that sense, um, that the very immovability, and that's why you get walls later on, the, in, the very immovability uh, of uh, a sedentary community means that they have a tremendous store of value, animals, slaves, uh, pots, and so on. You just take the list of any sort of highland, lowland raid, and you see what the barbarians are after. So my argument is that there's a long period that probably goes up to 1300 or so, which I call the golden age of barbarians, in which life has never been better. And it means that people actually move back to pastoralism and to hunting and gathering because they're such rich pickings. And the other thing that they have going for them is that there's now uh, a kind of trade across the Mediterranean and other places in which these cities are also trading posts in which many of the things that were not valuable before in the hinterland can now be sold for trade goods uh, uh, and so on. So actually the trading is probably more important than the raiding. You, you ex-Vikings should know something about this. Um, uh, and that the, the two actually go together as a form of subsistence. What I know less about, I guess, is the escapes that then change the natural world mm -hmm. outside mm -hmm. the domus. And I know that in your field it's almost impossible to tell now <clears throat> whether a salmon is, right, a uh, unspoiled salmon, right, uh, or whether it's interbred. Uh, mm -hmm. and. Uh, one imagines that this is the case mm -hmm. for lots, and it's certainly true with, uh, especially those things that go feral most easily, like pigs mm -hmm. uh, and dogs and so on, mm -hmm. that then becomes, uh, there is no outside right. left anymore. Uh, I'd love to turn, th thank you so much. I'd love to turn to a little, a different question um, that you alluded to earlier which is, as someone who's very interested in marine species, um, and since you brought up salmon, I'll take that as an invitation um, to talk a little bit about marine worlds and their links to domestication. Um, before I get closer to the salmon, um, I'd like to start off with a little bit of a different question on the maritime. And the first question I'd like to ask is um, about seafaring and the rise of maritime states. Um, while we know that sea-based travel has a long history, it seems that we don't see the rise of maritime states for quite some time, only in the past 2,000 to 3,000 years. Mm -hmm. And it seems that the rise of maritime trade kingdoms in Africa, India, Southeast Asia, and the Mediterranean marks almost a second wave of state formation. And since our focus here today is on domestication, I wanted to zero in on the multi-species implications of the rise of trade-based maritime states. Um, might it be interesting to ponder how the rise of such states changed the multi-species resettlement camps that the grain state nexus um, created? And it strikes me that this second wave state formation did not simply connect uh, people living in different environments, but also remade multi-species ecologies in a variety of ways. The most famous example of this um, is the 15th and 16th century Colombian exchange in which Portuguese and Spanish ships um, swapped plants, animals, and microbes among Europe, the Americas, Africa, and Asia. Uh, maritime states also increased the ability to move labor 
for example, through slave trading, something that came up earlier, um, in a way that seems likely to have furthered the concentration of people that, begun, uh, that began with settled agriculture. Um, what might we is there anything that we might gain, Jim, from positioning narratives of the rise of domestication-centered grain states alongside the rise of maritime trading kingdoms? Let me... Uh, there are many ways to enter this uh, corridor. <clears throat> the uh, maritime states are states that only arise as you say, um, with the burgeoning of trade. Um, and uh, you get them uh, first in the Mediterranean, Tyre and si Sidon, the sort of early uh, Pelop Peloponnesian uh, states, uh, also Egypt at the Delta, Phoen the Phoenicians and so on. And what's interesting to me is that they are absolutely dependent on the volume of trade and the changes in trade routes. And so if the trade routes change and their products are no longer in value and so on, they, they go on and off like lights all the time and they can go up quite quickly. Malacca, of course, being the Southeast Asian, is Malacca is the sort of perfect example of a place located perfectly between the Indian and China trade routes for the monsoon change. Mm -hmm. uh, and the thing that strikes me is that not only are there three things about maritime states. They are uh, dependent on the volume of trade, which varies a great deal. Um, they are cosmopolitan in terms of they only thrive by welcoming people who want to trade goods, uh, and they end up having the most incredibly varied linguistic uh, and ethnic backgrounds. Uh, they are actually quite extraordinary uh, that way. And the other thing about these states is that in the long run, they lose to the great agrarian empires. Mm -hmm. If you think of Genoa and uh, Venice, uh, uh, it, it, that it's only the, the places that were purely cosmopolitan trading centers mm -hmm. tended to disappear um, uh, because the Prussians and Russians and the French agrarian state um, were able to crush them militarily. So I think it's only those places, especially like England, that is a, some combination between an agrarian state and a maritime state at the same time uh, that was able to, mm -hmm. in a sense, have the advantages of, of both of these. So um, I'm not sure that's uh, responsive to what you wanted, but yeah. feel free to elaborate. <laughs> Well, I was actually going to pull us in a little bit of a different direction, but still sticking with the marine. But, so thank you very much. Um, I wanted to pull us towards something you mentioned earlier, which was this new spate of marine domestications. And one of the things um, that you mentioned in your talk today was that really um, there have been few, if any, additions to our major land-based economic crop for economic crops for millennia. Um, however, there have been a number of marine, ba of marine ones, um, salmon, shrimp, and several seaweeds, just to name a few. Um, one of the interesting things is that we may have lost our observational capacities and gotten dumber when it comes to domesticating terrestrial plants. But something's clearly happened when it comes to the domestication of marine organisms. And one of the interesting things is if you imagine um, a chart over time of the domestication of terrestrial organisms versus marine organisms, it's almost an inverse. So about 10,000 years ago, you see a ri right. you know, 10,000 years ago, you see this spike of terrestrial domestications and it flattens out with almost, with very, very few. Or with marine domestications, you see almost the inverse pattern, where you see very, very few marine domestications. You see eels um, in, in Aboriginal Australia, and you know, one can say perhaps um, shellfish in uh, indigenous, the indigenous Pacific Northwest. And then you see this huge spike of marine domestications in the last 100 years, right. since, the, since 1900. And I was just curious if you had any thoughts, um, especially since you brought it up in passing, you know, what's going on here? 
Mike considering marine domestication add another chapter to the story, you know, fires, animal, grains, us, and maybe oceans now. Um, and might that make any difference to how we think about domestication? I'd, uh, <clears throat> I'm in favor of having you write me a chapter about that. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, but if, if, if we were to do such a chapter, it seems to me we would actually have to think about the domestication yeah. of lots of other things as well, mm -hmm. like microbes mm -hmm. and yeasts mm -hmm. and so on. There is, and this is part, of course, about the commodification, right, and industrial production right. of uh, all kinds of species, uh, and we're getting around to all of right. them uh, pretty much eventually. Uh, so the latest, in a sense, uh, the aquaculture Mm -hmm. was in a sense a kind of early 20th century or 21st century uh, uh, change. And we w there were all kinds of microorganisms mm -hmm. that people are now kind of engineering, mm -hmm. not to mention genetically modified organisms as well. That's a, that's a, uh, but the commodification of that world is uh, quite frightening in terms of its ecological consequences as well. Mm -hmm. I wanted to mention something I forgot. It's uh, uh, to go back to the question of diseases, there's an interesting argument that, again, I'm not qualified to pronounce on, but I find it interesting. It's an argument made in Plagues and People by the elder McNeil. Uh, and his argument is that around uh, the year zero, for the first time, you had the exchange of disease pools from China and India and the Middle East that for the first time came into contact with uh, one another. And you had a spate of repeated infections and diseases and epidemics that killed the plague of Justinian was one of the sort of early ones that killed enormous numbers of people. And his argument in passing that I think is interesting is that this is of course exactly the time of the salvation religions and the axial <laughs> age when it's not clear that your time on earth is not extremely tenuous and people are dying mm -hmm. in huge numbers, whole communities dying at the same. So there's something it seems to me about the invention of salvation religions <laughs> and the effort to turn away from the world of the flesh that coincides with the fact that life is far mm -hmm. more tenuous and um, uh, than you ever imagined it might be before this kind of disease vector came to determine people's life chances. I think this is a perfect time to open the debate uh, to questions if you have them. If you haven't, put up your hands and there are two who will take microphones. While you think about your, your, um, your question, I just wanted to show all of you something. <laughs> and this is, a, I think it's a perfect response to your left. This is my social security card, my mm -hmm. two seconds court. You, you're giving your lecture, which is a tragic history of the rise of states, how we all became stupider, you know, died more, worked harder, you know, led more boring lives in, in a country that is perhaps the country in the world that loves its state the most, you know. Uh, you know, yeah. if, you're, if you're an American and see this, it, it is probably... You know, it's the sign of the devil or, or, <laughs> or even worse, of communism or something, you know, universal health care. But to a Dane, it's, it's fantastic. I can use it to borrow your latest book in the State Library just across the road. We love our states. We are completely state-controlled. All aspects of our lives are gathered together by the, by the CPR register that controls this card. And we think it's perfect. It's fantastic. So your tragic story of why, how we got here you know, I, I see from a global point of view why it is tragic, but from Denmark, from Aarhus. <laughs> you want me to respond to this? Yeah, <laughs> if you want to. <laughs> so, I think the Norwegians may love their state just as much as the Danes I think do. About <laughs> uh, it was, they have more and it's always striking for an American. I suppose in Norway, I don't know whether this happens in in Denmark as well, but in Norway when you call the doctor, they, I want to know your person number, all right? They don't want to know your name. Uh, and we find that, right, we Americans find that a little upsetting. Uh, and it seems to me that if you're going to have a state, as we all do now, then it better be 
a Leviathan that you have democratized and wrestled to the ground and that is strapped to certain minimum of uh, human welfare. And it seems to me that Scandinavian social democracy is the best domestication of the wild beast called Leviathan uh, <laughs> that we have existing in the world so that if you want to live in a state society, make it Denmark. <laughs> I think I know you have questions also, but save them because we will mix them in with questions from the floor. This one there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for a very uh, tremendously interesting um, talk. Um, I'm working in uh, North Asia, Siberia, yeah, which is an interesting case uh, in relation to, to domestication because the reindeer is one of the latest species to be domesticated, and it's actually a species that is still under domestication and has involved a transition from hunting to herding in Europe and uh, North Asia that is still going on and uh, basically took speed a couple of hundred years ago, so you have been able to sort of observe uh, what was going on. And I think that that case actually reveals a very different story about uh, the nature of domestication because these Arctic economies, just as well as the economies of uh, North America and South America, and probably also the hunter-gatherer economies of Southeast Asia, are highly moral economies, yeah? The hunter-gathering economies. They have the idea, you know, animals should give themselves up to humans. You know, there's a huge amount of respect uh, towards animal masters and all this kind of stuff. But the thing is that the question is whether this moral economy basically traps the hunter gather in a morally double bind, in the sense that uh, everyone who has gone hunting knows that animals will not stand still when you sing for them. If you took, take off a lot of uh, colored clothes, they will run away, and when you eventually kill them, I mean, it's often in a very messy process, yeah? So there's a huge discrepancy between the, the ideal and the moral economy, if you like, and how life is, in fact, practiced in everyday life. And what is interesting when you look at Siberia and the reindeer herders who go from hunting to sacrifice as a means of killing uh, uh, reindeer, the same species basically, is that they're doing exactly the same thing. It's the same moral economy. The only difference and the key difference is that when you have a sacrificial uh, reindeer, you have all the variables under control. You can actually make the perfect kill, the morally perfect kill, which is not predation, because you can pick the perfect reindeer, you can make it stand still, you can even put on colored clothes and sing for it, which is what they do, uh, and then you can kill it. So in that sense, it, it actually raises the question whether the, you know, the transition from hunting to herding was really driven by a moral, um, I mean, a, a, a sort of um, um, uh, a double bind, if you, a moral double bind in the hunter-gatherer economy that could then at least partially be solved through uh, a domestication of the very same species, the reindeer, yeah. I don't have anything particularly to add to that interesting <laughs> observation about the relationship between the hunter and the prey and the pastoralist and uh, his, um, uh, the animals he is pasturing. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually fairly familiar with the reindeer domestication, if we're going to call it that, from Piers Vitebsky's book, The Reindeer People, um, you know, about the ebony and the way in which somehow it seems to me that the ebony, that the domestication of reindeer actually has to do with a, uh, a great deal of accommodation of the grazing habits and movements and so on of reindeer themselves. And it's not clear to me that this isn't a kind of intermediate stage of domestication that's, uh, that's quite interesting. But in terms of the relationship between the moral economy of hunting and the moral economy of pastoralism, and we might actually ask if there's a moral economy of industrial production and slaughter as well, uh, is interesting to, uh, uh, to consider. I find it incredibly interesting, uh, being a fisherman myself but not much of a hunter, um, why it is that these, uh, to, in today's world, completely inefficient ways of collecting calories 
are still wildly popular uh, as a uh, form mostly of uh, expression of manhood uh, and why these fishing and hunting in particular should be so important culturally for places that haven't used them for subsistence purposes for thousands of years. Which I, I, I find that an interesting question to ponder. Yeah. Yes, thank you also, all four of you, for a wonderfully uh, inspiring uh, comments and contributions here. I stand here as, uh, or I should say my name is Helle Van Kille, and uh, I'm a prehistoric archaeologist, and my question uh, is based in, in that discipline. Um, I was just wondering uh, whether uh, your uh, work uh, here or your lecture point here is not underestimating the attractions inherent uh, to uh, agriculture uh, and husbandry because uh, uh, it was agriculture and husbandry uh, was looking at it uh, uh, from um, uh, from a, a perspective of world history enormously expansionist uh, and successful and uh, and there must have been some uh, some reasons for this uh, success um, and it occurred also to me that you are perhaps uh, reiterating the myth of this happy uh, yeah. for, uh, <laughs> hunter-gatherer and uh, the agriculturalist uh, who is trapped in right. resistance against this growing social order that you are envisioning uh, to us. But uh, the attractions uh, that I could see could be uh, 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 could have been there is these co-inventions of, uh, of uh, for instance, uh, the wheeled vehicles that made people go faster across larger distances, and also uh, uh, mythological inventions. By 2000 BC, we can see that uh, that uh, that these inventions were there. Uh, so, uh, would you please comment uh, on on that? Sure. That's the, I think that's the big question. I knew we'd get to it eventually, of how come uh, agriculturalists came to rule the world. Uh, and one uh, explanation goes back to this question that I said I couldn't resolve on the question of population pressure and resources. Because if you need to get a lot of, as Esther Bosrup would say, if you need to get a lot of calories out of a limited piece of land, uh, then plow agriculture and intensive agriculture are the way to go. So that's one explanation. I think there are other explanations, and again, I'm not fit to evaluate them. One of them is the rate of reproduction and fertility and fecundity of agricultural populations. That is to say, although mortality rates are enormously high, it appears that the rates of birth and live births in agricultural societies are far greater than they are in hunting and gathering societies because of the age at Menarche, of the ability to wean so that the spacing can be less uh, close. And you know, if you, even if there's a small difference in fertility rates and live survival rates, if you run that for a thousand years like compound interest, it makes a huge difference in the total population of hunters and gatherers uh, and, uh, and agriculturalists. So I think one thing is definitely true, that the agriculturalists out-reproduced hunters and gatherers uh, in a fairly decisive way. The second question that, again, I don't know, and it's suggested by uh, McNeil, is that the diseases that became endemic to the large population uh, of the early agrarian societies. They were lethal in the beginning and then they became gradually less lethal and more endemic. They were still uh, lethal to non-agricultural populations who came in contact with them. I'm not talking about the new world, I'm talking about the old world. And so one argument is that in fact, the new diseases spawned by these early civilizations actually killed off a large number of the hunting and gathering population who did not have the built up endemic immunities to these diseases. And that, so you, you can, if you combine 
the population increase and resource constraints, the, the uh, advantage in reproduction of agricultural populations over hunters and gatherers, uh, and if you add the possibility that the numbers of hunters and gatherers may have been vastly reduced by their exposure to diseases that were lethal for them but endemic to large agrarian populations, then uh, together they could account uh, not for the attraction of agriculture, but for how uh, account for the fact that we all became agriculturalists. How would your argument square with that of, um, what's his name, Jared Diamond, who makes also a claim to want to answer why we came to rule the world, us agriculturalists. And his argument, uh, you know, very briefly seems to be, it is by accident. It is just because we have inhabit a continent that lies this way, in which, right. you know, an invention here can spread along the, is it the longitude, this one? I forget, the latitude? Latitude. Latitude. Right. You know, without, you know, a cow invented here can go here, and it's right. because the climate is the same. Whereas if you're in a continent that goes this way, like Africa or uh, America, you invent something up here, and it doesn't travel down here very well because it has to travel across climatic zones. So his argument is, if we'd lived, you know, uh, in South America, we might have been very inventive, but the invention wouldn't have gone anywhere, and we would just have, you know, you know, exhausted ourselves inventing stuff. And uh, but it, so we just happened to in inhabit the right continent. Would that? Because you say it's f it's force. Uh, state force or yes, something, it, I mean, it, it, it's not actually. Right, I know the, the part of Diamond that I find uh, interesting in that respect is the question of the fact that the New World didn't have easily domesticable herd animals, right, that mm -hmm. had the kind of hierarchy that allowed us to take control of them. Uh, and maybe the question of the Isthmus of Panama and the latitude is, uh, is relevant too. But um, Certainly for the uh, prevailing of agriculture in the old world before 1500, uh, there is already a huge amount of commerce and movement back and forth so that things like inventions and diseases and, uh, and animals, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, things like the chicken which come from Southeast Asia as gallus gallus, that's already in the Middle East probably by 1,000 BC, I think. Uh, so it's interesting how these things, not to mention stirrups and the wheel and so on, they travel more or less like lightning, I think, uh, because they uh, have so many uh, immediate advantages uh, to them. Yeah. Nils? Okay, uh, th I would also like to thank you very much for showing us uh, what a dreadful lifestyle we sort of <laughs> adopted. <laughs> Uh, I, I think it was very interesting, but I would like to move into historical time and uh, something that you also uh, uh, talked a little bit about, the, um, the option of actually opting out of settled agriculture and going back to uh, the other lifestyle, hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Um, assuming that this is no longer an attractive or a feasible option uh, anywhere in the world today, maybe it is, I don't know, but could you say more about uh, when, that, when it stopped being a, a, a real opportunity for people to actually leave the, the agricultural state. I think I heard you saying something about maybe the post-plague uh, 14th century uh, in, in northwestern Europe, but in other parts of the world it might be much much more recently that, that, that this was no longer uh, a, a realistic or even an attractive uh, possibility. Right. It's a, uh, I, I don't think that that question can be answered for any particular place, I mean, for all places with the same dates. Um, I think it changes enormously. One observation that I'd make in beginning a reply is Owen Lattimore's observation of the Great Walls of China. We learn from our history books that the Great Wall of China was meant to keep the barbarians out. His argument, and many other people's argument since he first made it, is that the purpose of the Great Walls of China were to keep Chinese agricultural taxpayers inside the wall <laughs> where they could be conscripted and they could be taxed and that the danger was that they would go beyond the frontier and take up pastoralism. The fact is that there, 
it, there are lot, it's not as if one goes from being an agriculturist to being a pastoralist. A lot of pastoralists practiced some agriculture. A lot of agriculturalists practiced some pastoralism. So it meant not a sort of radical change of, of lifestyle in the kind of cultural trauma uh, version of the story, but it, it meant sort of adjusting one's portfolio to the conditions of the state and pressure and the availability of, uh, of resources uh, over time. It's certainly true that states are disappearing all the time in uh, between 6,000 BC and the year zero. Uh, the life expectancy of a state is actually extremely brief. Maybe two, three reigns is kind of quite extraordinary. And uh, we are mesmerized, completely mesmerized. This is a problem of, of a kind of the history of, of I think probably school books of museum archaeology, see, not for professional archaeologists, is that the briefly lived kingdoms that created stone monuments in one particular place that could be the site of an excavation, uh, even if they only lasted a brief time, they get all the pages in the history books. They leave the trinkets for the museum, and that's how school children learn about these societies. Whereas the blinking on and off and disappearance and collapse for one reason or another, and we often don't know what the reasons are, is so common that it was probably the experience of most people in this 6,000 year period, if they lived in a state, to have that state in their lifetime evaporate or atomize in which they were decentralized and had to change their subsistence options or the ratio of their subsistence options. So this was extremely common and I have the feeling, just like agriculturalists who live near forests, have a set of famine procedures of the foods that they can gather from the forest if the crops fail in the same way that these populations were accustomed to, have to having to adjust their subsistence uh, depending on the kind of circumstances. And one of the circumstances was the disappearance of the state. And you might also want to leave the state if there was a war of succession, uh, if there was an epidemic. There are all kinds of reasons of leaving the state rather than uh, aside from just having to work hard on your fields. Yeah, hi, um, thanks for a great and quite controversial talk. And uh, in a sense, I just considered withdrawing my question because, I, because Helle Venkil, my colleague, who, and I'm also an archaeologist, asked you about the potential advantages of, of agriculture and your answer about the reproductive benefits, which are clearly documented archaeologically, even though people get less tall, they get more ill, but there are so many more of them as soon as you get <laughs> agriculture. Yeah. I think to me is provide the crucial missing piece that I was sort of looking for in your talk earlier, which I think very much sketched out a kind of an ecological model for the success of agriculture and the subsequent success of states as, as creating artificial ecologies which in, within which lots of, lots of people could, could live with lots of unintended consequences as well. Now, my question then really becomes a methodological kind of question. Do you draw up ultimately an evolutionary picture of how social institutions and economies change from hunter-gatherer economies to early agricultural economies to state economies? And do we then have to ask the crucial question, for whose advantage are these systems so that you can tally up at the bottom line the reproductive success about which globally I think there is no doubt that yeah agricultural societies of agriculture has led to the, the global dominance of humans in the Anthropocene. Is it an evolutionary picture you're providing? I, I guess I, I want to uh, push the query back to you. Um, in what sense, it may be an historical sequence, but I'm not sure why you want to use the word evolutionary theory as if it's somehow can be understood in, in selection pressure and Darwinian terms. Do you mean ev evolutionary story in the strong sense, or do you mean just an historical sequence that happens to uh, match the, um, the eventual hegemony of states over non-state peoples? I mean, in quite a strong sense, in the way that uh, um, 
let's be provocative, in particular women could have uh, quite willingly entered into early agricultural economies because they could increase uh, the number of offspring they could have by, for example, not moving quite so frequently and having, uh, being able to provide crucial uh, weaning foods. Um, and and you, as you assume that's a, a, the desire for more children is something you can assume from just as a starting premise. It's, I suppose, what a biologist would do if they would look at humans like they would look at every other animal. Every other animal. Um, well, I'm, I'm, uh, again, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, we, we're, taking, we're taking the facts of reproduction, which we agree on, as near as I understand it, uh, and then the question of whether... Uh, I have a different story, perhaps, to tell about uh, reproduction. Uh, that is, uh, in, in which I would not want to start with the assumption that other things equal, women would want to have as many children as possible. Um, uh, I would start with the assumption that the early states were absolutely manpower-based and wanted to maximize their population on the alluvium, uh, both for uh, military purposes and for production and tax uh, purposes. And I would also argue that the state comes into existence along with the creation of the patriarchal family. And the patriarch is, if you like, the state for the family and controls the working labor of the children. And the patriarch ha does have an interest, I think, on agricultural land to have the maximum number of children whose labor he can uh, appropriate. So I, I, would, I would produce the same statistical results as you but with a different story of the likely reasons behind them. So I, I would be interested, what, it's that assumption that women would like to have uh, uh, as mo many children as possible that I, I guess I, I want a, uh, a story about. I think you and Felix can perhaps discuss the, the details of this later. The, 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 the evidence base of it. I know Jens Christian has a, a point to make. I also just want to say that there is the evidence, but there's also, it seems to me, a, a, the question of politics here. You are a self-avowed anarchist, and I think provide, you, it would be fair to say, an anarchic story of civilization telling us basically that our own domestication leads us to a particular view of history in which we assume that there must be attractions, those we, self, we experience ourselves, to joining states in agriculture and project them back into history right. as if they were natural and give them a name like evolution or something. But it's actually a particular kind of political history that you want to provide an alternative to. Would that be fair? Correct. Correct. So I just had a, a small comment to this, uh, to this dialogue. And it's, it's, I've, I, I can see that you possibly could apply an analogy to a biologically evolutionary mechanism to this development, but I don't think it requires any kind of intentionality. Biological evolution don't require that. It just requires a mechanism that provides a fitness difference, which could be this difference in reproductive rates, and a hereditary mechanism, which could be a cultural hereditary mechanism to work in this case. So I don't think it requires intentionality. Right, correct. Uh, time is sort of running out. Was there a question down there? Oh dear. Maybe we could take those two questions first. Would that be okay? Yes, if that's okay, and then take uh, this one later. Okay, um, I, I also enjoyed your talk a lot, and you know, as an anthropologist, I don't know anything about history, so it was really nice to uh, kind of have the long, you know, uh, view of the deep history. Um, but um, my question is actually about this uh, relationship between domestication and then the strengthening of coordination through uh, state powers. Uh, I mean, so I was just thinking, you know, what would it take for a relaxation or a, even a reversal of domestication uh, to occur, a kind of loosening of state coordination in a sense, uh, at the heart of the domus, as you call it. In a sense, you know, how might a new uh, wilderness be made on the inside of the domus. And I think that you mentioned, of course, something like the black 
plague, and you could also kind of think of stuff like uh, you know w uh, civil wars and uh, natural calamities, of course. But I was also thinking, you know, you know, is it also possible that that this kind of loosening or even reversal could happen, not through a, a, a you know a loosening of state power, but through a strengthening of s state power, uh, an increase of state coordination? And I was trying to think of, of of a few examples, and I came up with, and I'll be short, so I'll just only take one. And you you mentioned that you're into sheep herding, so um, you know I was, I was thinking that in the EU, I know that now because of the E uh, of uh, sorry in the UK because of the EU um, uh, subsidies and the uh, taxation systems, it's much more uh, lucrative for estate owners to let the land life fa uh, fallow rather than invest in in sheep farming, you know, marsh fences and all this. And one consequence has actually been that you have sheep now losing uh, the capacity for hefting, you know, basically to know where they are. So they are running more loose than ever before, right? So I just think, you know, do we have any examples in this part of the deep history, which I know nothing of, where we actually have a kind of uh, a reversal of domestication, but through the intensification of state coordination? Uh, keep that in mind. A reversal of domestication. And the second question? I'll be coming up right now. I'll just heard it down here. Yeah. Um, more to the present and to the future and relevant to the, to the last question. Uh, how, what, how do we make use of this critical perspective in history? And uh, from your personal experience, because it's not usual for an academic, for example, to be a farmer, to have a non-conventional life, how do we resist uh, in this uh, trend of uh, specialization and uh, uh, in, uh, all this trend that it's more or less leading us to, let's suppose that it's leading us to a dead end. What's the, what would be your personal suggestion or your, uh, what, what would you think of the future, for example, 100 years from now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Should we just hear the last question as well and sum up on all three questions too? Okay, sure. Uh, my question was thinking about the future actually. And since you brought it up, I was curious, can seven billion humans eat a paleo diet or a hunter-gatherer diet? Can nine billion in 2050? Or do we have to eat wheat and corn and therefore is there not a kind of a ethical imperative to eat wheat and corn? Thank right. you. Um, the, 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 to take the last question first, uh, your, your, I think your argument is completely correct. And the problem is that there are nine billion of us, right? Uh, and it seems to me, uh, it's, uh, as you say, it's impossible for nine billion people to live on a paleo diet. A true paleo diet, by the way, or sort of raw, a lot of paleo diets are just raw food. And I am told by Richard Wrangham's book on cooking that uh, even if you mash it and uh, <laughs> it's pre-masticated, everyone who only eats raw food loses weight without exception, right? So it's a, a kind of starvation diet, a true paleolithic raw food uh, diet, even with the mashing and, uh, and so on. Um, this question of... Um, uh, reversal of domestications. I imagine, although no one writes about this, um, that a tremendous number of only recently, and talking about the Middle East, let's say Mesopotamia and Egypt and so on, of animals when states collapsed or epidemics killed uh, thousands and thousands of people and flocks just wandered off to fend for themselves. One imagines that uh, animals that have only been recently domesticated, like eat, uh, ducks and uh, sheep and goats, uh, could revert relatively easily, perhaps not at the same numbers uh, as before. But I imagine that that took, uh, uh, that took place quite commonly, um, and that uh, you know there's some, uh, there some animals that do better at being feral than others, uh, and it depends on the process of domestication, but certainly uh, pigs are a famous uh, example, and I think dogs, many dogs do uh, feralness quite well 
uh, also, as opposed to previously wild animals that seem to be depend on the domus. It seems to me, it's not clear to me that the sparrow would do very well without the domus. It's not clear to me that mice and rats would do very well without uh, having the domus and grain and human wastes uh, to, uh, uh, to take advantage of. Um, uh, as far as the future, I have, I have enough trouble organizing my own life without telling people <laughs> what should happen in 100 years or, uh, and so on. I, I found, and I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, I, don't, I don't want to trumpet my uh, 25 years of sheep raising, because I don't think I was a great successful uh, shepherd. I had maybe 25 ewes, which resulted in maybe 36 lambs that I sold to the Greeks and Italians at Easter, uh, which was <laughs> the sort of big market in New England for, and I did my own shearing and shearing for neighbors, but I found it, I don't think I was a, a tremendously successful uh, shepherd, and my goal, uh, the final breeds with which I ended up were breeds that I chose because very few lambs were lost. Uh, and in my last three years, I think I only lost a single lamb, and that was my proudest achievement. So in a sense, I, was a I realized that when I started raising sheep, I uh, did the uh, agricultural fertility uh, model. Uh, I got Finn Dorset crosses, which were twins and triplets, and sometimes they bred twice a year. And I had the maximum number of lambs. I also had a huge number of dead lambs as well. But I produced lambs uh, at a very high rate. And it so demoralized me to see the consequences of that kind of shepherding that I gradually moved to the breeds that would have fewer lambs but took better care of them and strong lambs that were up and nursing uh, because my goal was not to make money but to bury the fewest number of lambs uh, possible. And I also found that uh, what little farming I did, it, um, uh, you know, we all waste money playing, waste time uh, playing the guitar, reading the newspaper, and I needed something that um, left my head alone and used my body uh, every day. So I didn't find it an intrusion at all in terms of my uh, kind of intellectual life. I was my um, relaxation time. Well. Thank you so much, James, for this, or Jim, and thank you so much, Heather and, and Jens Christian, for being part of this as well. Um, I have, it wouldn't be an event without some gifts, and it's interesting how I escape crops make really poor gifts, but, <laughs> you know, hard-to-move crops are actually much better gifts, and I have some here. Uh, they come in two forms. Uh, wine for you guys. <laughs> Hard to move. <laughs> uh, the, the grapes are at least. Here you go, Heather. Thank you. And for you, we picked out whiskey. <laughs> just to just to let you know that some good things come out of grain. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for attending this. Um, I will keep the, the, the person on his knees, you know, uh, hands and knees, figuring out or suddenly realizing that he's the, the slave of the tomato plant in my mind as a kind of a shorthand, <laughs> you know, for what your argument is. We're all kind of slaves and we love it. It's a strange fact of modern life. Um, there is also a gift for you guys. Um, Wine will be served back there uh, on the tables with the tablecloth on it. Um, hang around if you have the time and if you're not too hungry. We, Jim, will be there and uh, we will be there if you wanted to have a chat. Uh, please keep your uh, eyes peeled for the next Futures Lecture in the autumn. It will be advertised on the... Um, Institute, um, no, it's called School now, School website where you all signed up for this. Um, I should also want to thank, I also want to thank uh, Ulrich Foskerau and Sine Larsen and Camilla Dimke who were all, you know, organizing all the practical 
uh, details and aspects of this. Uh, it is the first time we've done it. I hope you enjoyed it and hope to see you again. Thank you.